Hi, welcome everybody. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to share my desktop. Okay. All right, can everybody see that okay? Yeah. Great. Yeah. Great. So hi, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to today's community call uh, from the Internet of Production Alliance. I'm Sarah Hutton, a Research and Community Engagement Lead um, with the IOP. And today we're going to be talking about the journey of Open Nowhere or the OKW um, data specification, where we've been and where we're going. And looking forward to having a conversation with you all about how we're going to get there and to gather information and uh, your input as community members who are stakeholders in this work. Um, so the agenda in brief for today is going to be an, an hour long. Um, Andrew Lamb is going to give us a few updates on the IOP and upcoming events. And then we'll jump right into talking about OKW and the work that has been done um, historically and that we're currently undertaking on mapping global manufacturing capabilities. And then we're going to have a um, dive into more of a collaborative um, generative community exercise where we're gonna gather information from you. So, um, here again is the link for the community notes. Um, I'll drop that in chat intermittently throughout the call. I encourage folks to jump in there, um, introduce yourselves, I'll also post questions there that you might have and we'll address them over the course of the call. So Andrew, go ahead and take it away. Thanks everyone. And thanks for joining today's call. And um, yeah, we. These calls are important to, to the Internet of Production Alliance. It helps, gives people an opportunity to check in and hear what's going on. And um, I'm really excited about today's theme around um, the, the mapping of, uh, the geographic mapping of machines around the world. And looking forward to hearing from today's speakers. I'm the chair of the Alliance and uh, my uh, big part of my role is to um, help uh, develop projects and bring in uh, resources. So I'm glad to provide some updates uh, today on three of the main projects we're working on at the moment. Um, there are three logos um, that are significant here. The Make project, which is the funny orange M. Uh, this is the uh, web address for it. The Make project uh, is for African and European maker innovation ecosystem. And this is about uh, trying to uh, support the maker movement across Europe and Africa. And one of the things that the Internet of Production is doing for that project is uh, around the mapping of machines as we'll hear about today. But it's about trying to um, help find ways to distribute and decentralize manufacturing uh, across um, the two continents and to bring the two continents together. Now, the sister project of that is called Innovative Manufacturing in Africa. And this is um, uh, from the Research Innovation, Research Innovation Systems Africa scheme, uh, RISA it's called. And this is uh, funded by UK Aid. And uh, you'll see on the um, slide there nine logos well these are nine maker spaces um, that we are uh, funding and supporting and collaborating with over the course of this calendar year and uh, basically what we're going to be trying to do is um, develop maker space indicators do research capacity building with each of the maker spaces so they can conduct their own research um, more, uh, increasingly in line with what's required by uh, formal publication. Um, we're going to be doing some distributed manufacturing trials, including the making, the mapping the machines that these maker spaces have and distributing contracts to them. And we're going to be launching a series of um, operating models and business model resources that ties in with the Make project. So there's a, there's a sort of, uh, the MAKE project is uh, two continents, it's quite broad, uh, and it's funded by the European Commission. The RISA Innovative Manufacturing in Africa project is focused on nine maker spaces in sub-Saharan Africa in three countries, Kenya, uh, Ghana, and South Africa. 
and is funded by UK Aid. But the two things are working very closely with what you're going to be hearing about today in the mapping of uh, machines. Um, and of course, they're focused on the maker movement and maker spaces, but um, a lot of what the Internet of Production is trying to do is broader than that. It's about um, the, the you know, development or the enabling infrastructures um, or, that are needed for a new paradigm of production for distributed manufacturing to do for um, production what the internet has done for, for the production of things, what the internet has done for the production of content. One of the ways that we're supporting um, the development of these standards is through the Alpha P Sloan Foundation. Uh, we're very grateful to them for their support and they've been able to help us with the open nowhere um, map infrastructure and some of the awards that we'll be hearing from today as well. So really a lot of the thanks today is going to the Alpha P Sloan Foundation for their support. On um, other projects, small, slightly smaller projects, but no less important um, because they're key parts of, of what we're trying to do at the Alliance. We're working on governance processes and this isn't just governance for uh, the Alliance as a community, but governance also for the internet of production more broadly and yes some we have a small grant from the code code for science and society in the us that's helping us to work on that and there's work getting started there if you're interested in being part of some of those discussions we have a governance task force and we have some research work starting under that project but it's this is really about the, the governance of um, not just the alliance but the internet of production and then we're continuing some work um, that we got from the next generation, we got funding from the next generation internet initiative of the European Union through open source ecology, our, our friends and partners in Germany. Uh, and they um, and our team have been working on uh, tooling for um, designs and documentation portability. So the idea of being able to um, enable the portability of uh, the documentation that you need to be able to make things and rather than being locked into any particular vendors um, ecosystem uh, software ecosystem so there's uh, Max and uh, who's on the call today and um, uh, his colleagues have been working uh, on that quite a lot and then if we can go on to the next slide um, I, by the way, I should say, if you want to hear more about the portability, if you haven't learned uh, about that quite yet, there was previous community call recordings you can refer to to learn about that. But uh, some events that are coming up, um, Sarah is uh, going to be representing the Internet of Production Alliance at the Open Source Hardware Association annual gathering, which is um, an event I'd recommend to you all. It's uh, one day in person, one day uh, online and um, it's a, a gathering of you know one of the key organizations that's been promoting open source hardware um, so you can sign up to that if you're interested and see what the um, uh, is going on in that particular uh, part of the manufacturing community um, we have just had actually the kickoff call for the RISA project, the nine maker spaces. So you'll be able to see a recording of that soon. We've got some very exciting maker spaces in Africa that we're working with. We have a governance task force call coming up and um, there's next week, the global innovation gathering community that we're part of, which is a community of lots of innovation maker spaces and labs all over the world. Um, they, uh, doing the next in the series of um, webinars on uh, business models for maker spaces and for distributed manufacturing. So um, the, I'll share the Global Innovation Gathering um, website link and you should be able to find that webinar in there. Um, and then one of the other things that we're doing as part of some work we're in reviewing the alliance's um, uh, you know theory of change but also in some of our communications work is that one of the the founders of the alliance uh, 
Doc, um, who's a, a designer based in New York, is going to be helping us with some persona workshops as well. So if you're interested in, ah, oh, thanks for the link to the Global Innovation Gathering there. Um, so if you're interested in being part of that persona workshop uh, as a, a member of the Alliance, please do get in touch. Um, as ever, if, if you're interested in finding out more about the Alliance, please do reach out to us. Uh, there'll be, um, obviously you've got the contact details from for this webinar, but you can keep in touch with Sarah and I. I'll put my email in the chat. And um, I think we, without any, unless there's any questions about updates from the Alliance, um, we can dive straight into uh, the topic of today's community call. Sarah? Great, thank you so much, Andrew. Um, so we're gonna move right into telling the, the story and the journey mapping um, of Open Nowhere OKW. Gonna hand over the mic to Max Warda, who is our technical lead and has been a part of this process all along the course. Take it away, Max. Thank you, Sarah, and uh, thanks everyone for joining. Um, so uh, I'm going to start with a very brief sort of recap of um, Open Nowhere, uh, where it's been, and what we're looking at is is sort of later, a little bit later on in the call is to um, allow time for exploring sort of what the next chapter of the story looks like, and that's going to be a, a, what we're hoping to be able to allocate um, a lot more time to later today. Um, so um, the Open Nowhere um, sort of effort within the IOPA um, started by the sort of recognizing the need to be able to um, locate manufacturing capabilities and manufacturing facilities um, around the world um, along a lot of different use cases, whether it's for makers or humanitarian or, or aid organizations um, and others. And the work started by working on defining a standard for documenting or basically sort of a metadata standard for uh, describing manufacturing facilities, manufacturing capabilities and, and machines and tools uh, within these spaces um, worldwide. And the idea is, is basically to make it easier to, to be able to find a way you can get things made in, in a distributed manufacturing uh, model. So we see this as a very key part of the whole um, sort of infrastructure that's needed to enable the shift towards um, distributed manufacturing. Um, we have um, there, there's a couple of links that I'd encourage you to um, to visit. Um, there is a, a link, that's the work, we've got a um, basically a category or, or a, a, a working group um, section on the IOPA's community um, uh, forum where we, um, you know, basically have, have the conversations around the work around mapping. Um, and the IOPA website has a section on Open Nowhere where you can actually link, you can get a little bit more information um, and link to the um, published, the, the standard that's been published um, as well. Um, if you can move on to the next slide, Sarah, thanks. Um, so the um, initial effort, um, as I said, was very much around sort of wanting to define the standard to be able to collect data and put that data on a map so that that map can help people find uh, facilities and find machines and tools um, based on whatever it is that they wanted to get made. Um, in, and this this um, standard was um, was published, as I said, it's sort of it's a, it's a it's quite a broad metadata standard that covers a lot of different aspects of manufacturing uh, machines, tools, processes, facilities, and much more. And the initial efforts um, were um, driven very much sort of during um, the effort to address sort of um, to respond basically to the pandemic. There were a lot of efforts um, led by uh, Field Ready, for example, and the Open Street Map, who uh, train surveyors to go out in various countries around the world and collect data about uh, manufacturing facilities at the time. It was, again, the focus was very much on facilities that had the capabilities relevant to the pandemic response. Um, and so we've managed to collect a lot of data um, using, using that method. We've also been looking at aggregating data from different um, places such as the Fab Labs network and other mapping efforts that have been carried out for um, mapping manufacturing facilities. 
Um, and the, we've also um, been conducting um, an initiative known as the Open Nowhere Data Awards, um, and um, Sarah and David will later be expanding more on that effort as well. Um, and um, currently, in, as, apart from the, um, the mapping effort itself, the data collection and mapping, um, there are the, the focus of sort of the output and the tooling that we're working on is in the context of um, these two projects. So MAKE is a European H2020 funded project that um, is focused on sort of hardware um, digital innovation hubs. Um, and it has uh, five primary goals of sort of looking at different business models and revenue streams for uh, maker spaces ar um, around, uh, sorry, in um, Europe and Africa, as well as community building, skills building, um, and um, the the um, the work that we're doing specifically is around um, uh, looking at skills, mutual skills recognition, which Sarah is is leading on, and mapping of machinery and um, maker spaces in Europe and Africa as well. So that's that, that that's one mapping effort that Antonio will be um, showing you some of the results of that effort um, shortly and. The other main effort that we've been doing is, is uh, with regard to some uh, the funding that we've received from the Sloan Foundation to gather um, global manufacturing data. And we're looking at sort of collecting, the target for us is to collect 150,000 points of interest, uh, which we define as sort of different machines and tools um, around the world. And that effort is very much closely linked to the data awards that we'll be um, looking at shortly as well. Um, and I think that's probably the perfect segue for yeah for David to tell us a little bit about his experience with um, with the data Absolutely. awards. Absolutely. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to David Castilla, um, who is a microbiologist. Um, he has a PhD in biomedical sciences with UNAM Mexico, and he's been associated with many DIY bio projects that involve the use of digital manufacturing techniques for the design and development and construction of open source bioreactors high-pressure liquid chromatic systems, 3D-printed microscopes, and much, much more. Um, he's going to be joining the ASU Biodesign Institute as a research scientist very shortly, very shortly. Um, I know you're going to be uh, moving soon, David, and um, I'll let you take it from here. Just let me know when you want me to advance the slides. Yeah, sure. Um, well, hello, everyone, and thank you, Sarah, for the introduction. Uh, I'm really happy to be here to present some of the effort that we have been um, working together with, um, with the IOPA. And uh, well, today, what I'm going to show you is a very, very, very quick, um, uh, a quick talk about what we've been doing uh, together here at Glixion and um, also with my associate, Greg uh, Merritt. Uh, so please, uh, Sarah, if you could go ahead with the first slide. So our project was related in trying to understand the mapping and 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 trying to figure out where are the capabilities, uh, digital manufacturing capabilities across Latin America, which is not an easy task in terms of uh, we were not in the in the area physically, but we uh, Greg and I decided to <laughs> go forward and try to design the best strategy in our hands to collect the data that we wanted to to know a little bit more. So. Um, if, if, you, if you could pass to the next slide, please, Sarah. So initially what we did, uh, according to being adhering to the standards that have been proposed by IOPA, it tried to first uh, create an instructor survey and reaching out the community that we were connected with. Mm, we started essentially in Mexico, Argentina, and Brazil, which are the most, um, uh, which is the closest um, hubs and makerspaces that we are aware and we have worked with them in the past. So we created a structured survey, which is at the beginning was a little bit lengthy in order to try to collect most information that we could have for uh, knowing uh, who is behind the, the organization and the type of machinery that, that they are carrying on in their maker spaces or their, their businesses. So many of the categories that are presented here are the initial scope. Like we try to more or less um, uh, try to separate the data that we were collecting into the different types of technologies associated to digital manufacturing. But this is not a comprehensive uh, coverage because we know that this is probably like the most 
top of mind associated to many of the people and the users. And I, I what we thought that, that this probably was the best idea. So as you can see, uh, the leading technology and, or the most common technology associated to either users and the people offering that is 3D printing. Later on, with uh, a second place is laser cutting and CNC machines. And there's here uh, to, uh, um, a data that need to be taken in, in, in cautiously because there's an overlap of many of the places that are offering many of these technologies together. Uh, but we just find out that uh, even though that the predominant technology is, is 3D printing, uh, there are many other associated technology, like for example, CNC and all, many of the business are also offering all the solution like electronics and uh, kits, electronic kits for, for assembling either your own uh, 3D printers and or uh, uh, create your customizations on, on different uh, machinery. Um, so there's an overlap distribution that it should be addressed that many of these points that we are presenting here up to around 3,500 points uh, split down in, into all these um, these categories uh, need to be addressed that many of the services of these spaces are offering all of them together, or sometimes they're just specializes in one of them. Uh, could, we, uh, could we just move to the next one, please, uh, Zara? So uh, there are some useful findings. Also, we run several uh, uh, interviews with the maker uh, spaces and their and their uh, and their people in order to know a little bit more on which are the challenges that these spaces are facing, not just during the pandemic, but also in the general context of their local uh, uh, the local uh, laws or there was any support from the institution in their in their in the countries to residents. So there is an overlap not just in the type of technologies that are presented here, but also in the need. Like for example, many of them are training uh, centers that are not associated directly with any formal institution or any formal academic institution. So there is a, an overlap between academia, the training spaces that are independent and the industry. And many of the challenges that the digital manufacturing spaces are facing is that sometimes they have to cover up their costs using a kind of a membership uh, agreement or a membership a business model, which is sometimes a very, very small community that they are, they are attending. And also there is a lack of awareness that many of the people uh, or the potential users are not aware of the potential of these technologies. And the other thing is that there are no regulatory framework. So many of these spaces are growing or being established without any support from either any institution. Many things have changed, but other things have for good and for bad equally. And I'm mentioning this because it's important to address that when we are uh, covering and, and um, trying to extract the data. This is what has been included sometimes in the in the in the surveys to know a little bit more that many of these spaces that we are uh, mapping up uh, it could be be present at at the beginning of of their of the lifespan, but facing on many of these challenges, the services have to be either deprecated or no longer existent. Uh, so because of that, many of these spaces lack. There is a lack of funding for either public or private funds, and there is also a lack of interest of many authorities in in order to support these spaces. So um, there are so many many other issues related to the importation of the machinery because is like we could be uh, facing in the future is like well we have more or less localized the point in which uh, we have seen a higher density of this technology being implemented and rolled out, but uh, probably these these people also need access to uh, other types of um, of uh, of support, like for example, uh, whenever they need to have a, a piece for, 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 for importing and, and there's a machine that needs to be repaired or uh, many other type of services that depend uh, depend also on the on the on the countries of manufacturing from from this machinery. So um, in general, the lifespan of these these spaces are about two to three years in average. Many of them have endured the, the, the pandemic, and this is a good news, actually. Uh, but in general, this is more or less from the site of the independent maker space in Fabla that we have uh, we have contact with. Uh, could you pass, please, the next one, uh, Sarah, please? Okay, so this is uh, more or less the general, uh, very, very, very general uh, uh, result that we have um, we have got over the over the over this time with uh, with our project. So this is the heat map uh, of many of the points that we have been working with. That of course it was designed by Antonio, uh, but well, well, 
it is 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 a map that of course we're gonna develop a little bit longer. Uh, but it's covering the majority of the category that we we included in our surveys. Uh, the second part of our survey is not just rolling out the survey and contacting the places, but also validating the information. That was, I think, the most painstaking process because sometimes many of these um, uh, these businesses or associations or organizations are available, have a presence in, on the net, but. Uh, and, and that's something that is very important, not just uh, where and how much, but also how well connected they are. If they're still alive and, you know, giving signs that they're still offering the services that they they claim to, to provide. Uh, and that was, I think, the most challenging part. Um, we believe so, um, somehow that this is an, actually an under, underrepresented estimation. Uh, we are including also, because we're still running uh, some of the mappings, other categories that we're including large uh, industrial man ma machining, also plastic injection and molding, and also fabric and, uh, and clothing and stoneware or automatic ceramic production, and also aerospace. Um, as you can see in this uh, slide, many of the categories in which are included, like in the in the, in the previous break uh, breakdown that I presented. Uh, the most important uh, to, to notice here in this heat map, it not just is is incorporating the use of, the, of these technologies, but also uh, the density of them. So as you can see in our map, uh, the majority of the of either the companies or Fab Lab or uh, are located in the same spaces that we suspected, Mexico and, and, and around the industrial areas in Mexico City, and also in Sao Paulo in the case of Brazil and in Argentina, in Buenos Aires, and in Chile. So these are the most uh, relevant spaces, at, at least in Latin America. There are many other spaces, like for example, we couldn't see anything in Cuba, or or there is a low presence of this, this adoption of these technologies in, in the Caribbean area. So uh, probably with the next um, round of, of, uh, of data, which include many of the categories that just presented here, uh, with the large scale machining or the, the fabric of stoneware, we could have another clear idea of, of which of the industries, not just by uh, how fast they have adopted new technologies like additive to, uh, the construction of technology, but also how many of the traditional process has been included into the uh, and, and incorporation of the novel technologies for the for the traditional process. So, well, so far, I think this is uh, from our side. And uh, well, with Okay, so thank you very much if you have any for the question. Thank you so much, David. This is, so what we were going to be moving into next um, is that as I as I mentioned um, in chat, um, and for those just joining, um, Antonio and Naya, who David had just been referring to, will be providing a live demo of this heat map shortly to see, um, as David had mentioned, you know, in the next round, we're looking to gather additional data points and expand the mapping process. And as uh, Max had alluded to earlier, a part of that is in um, working in collaboration with the MAKE project. Um, and so I'll be talking a little bit more in, in a couple of minutes about round two and, and just want to, you know, share appreciation and so much gratitude for the work of David Castilla and his team and, Having had these conversations about, you know, lessons learned um, from the data collection process really helped to move us forward and um, to the the next the next iteration um, of this work. And so I'm going to pass it over now to Antonio Anaya, who has been leading um, this. This data mapping work. Um, can you? Are you ready, Antonio? Yes. Great. All right. I'm going to mute myself. Hi, everyone. Um, Antonio here. And I invite you to scan the QR code if it's possible for you to interact with the map also in your phones. Um, so what we see here is uh, there is a, a map that's the output of a map generator tool. Um, so the data that it's displayed there. It's showing a heat map, like the one that uh, was uh, presented by um, David. Uh, in this case, uh, we are mapping here 
these categories of machines. Like in your right, the top right, you will see there are 3D printers, scanners, vinyl cutting machines, and, and so on. So, and if you notice too, and if Sarah uh, can help me with that, if you zoom in in the any of the numbers as you see there, like uh, there's a few circle numbers there. Yeah, it's a good one. Uh -huh. So what you see there, and if you click to any of these points um, there, uh -huh, you see a specific machine. So I will explain more about how this, this works and how the data is organized and, and to display it like this. But the idea of offering maps is to make it easier to, to know where to produce uh, something. And uh, there are different use cases. Um, like sometimes you will need to know just where you can go and laser cut something, but you don't need to know what specific machine they have there. In other occasions, you will have to know the specific machines to know like the build size of, uh, of the machine and to know that it, if the build size is enough for, is big enough for, for your project. So um, uh, compacting the, the data, filtering the data, organizing it, and then um, displaying this uh, uh, quite challenging effort because uh, when we receive data, uh, that we have two main things, two main ways to receive this data. So one is in big data sets. When we receive data in this way, it's quite difficult to filter sorting everything, especially when the collection has been uh, a free input text. Like you can understand if it's very difficult to classify things depending on and and, and how well written or uh, collected are, are are these data fields. And um, so the map is, uh, the tool is in, in uh, development stage, uh, stage right now. So the idea is to provide this in the, in the next weeks as a tool to generate data and based on different sources um, and also different needs that you have. This one is generated for the make project and is using data that has been collecting for that purpose. But the idea is to show maps for different countries and regions. Um, Sarah, if you could go for the next slides, please. Thank you. So as I was explaining, there are two different ways to receive this data. Uh, the one that we are using right now for the MAKE project is uh, um, mainly uh, 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 record by record. So we have a form that's customized mm -hmm and also parameterized to make it easier to uh, collect machine data. Um, we are offering a catalog of machines and materials that uh, are online for different vendors. So instead of collecting data in the, as a free input text, we are offering a list of machines that you could possibly have in your Fab Lab Makerspace or Innovation Hub. In that way, we are trying to have a better quality in the, the and more granular information in the in the machine data that we collect, and um, for the materials, that's something that we are opening uh, for the discussion on how to classify materials. There are uh, people working on that right now, um, and the crucial point of this uh, process is the data validation, like uh, uh, David was was mentioning before, is a uh, the challenges are, are to know if the data that we have is related to a real location and if the data is still current, this is still updated, this is the latest version of, of the information and that's available online. And um, so during the validation process, we also look for duplicates, misplaced data, typos, null data and all that. So um, it's easier when you manage all this from a form that you control and you can uh, also work in the, um, the quality of, uh, while collecting the data one by one. And um, so at the end, the, the challenges with this kind of uh, data collection way is uh, that we need to also um, reach more people by 
uh, make a diffusion of the tool and the community engagement. So it it, it depends a lot on, on that. Um, could you please uh, go for the next slide, Sarah? Yes, thank you. Um, so in the other way we have is by receiving the bunch of data. So or scrapping the, the data that's online. And for that, we need to select the source. We need to know that the source is relevant for the open hour uh, scope. And then we go and we collect the data. We make a data set of that by scrapping accessing database APIs or by um, receiving uh, Excel files or CSV files from uh, the contributors. Like for example, the data words and then other programs that we have uh, that, that have contribute data for the open hour mapping. And again, the validation is a crucial point of this process, um, but in this case, it's a, a more time consuming because if just imagine you have 10,000 rows and uh, you need to normalize this data and the, there is no uh, a taxonomy or, co or, or common language to name things, or to refer to things, you end up potentially with uh, thousands of entries and need to check manually, and that's very time consuming. Uh, so it always requires some manual uh, check-ins, uh, no matter the level of automations, because um, it's not easy to identify data and to know, for example, when you are referring to a 3D printer to a CNC machine, there's lots of similarities. And so, on that process, I have uh, worked a lot on how to classify machines using NLP uh, algorithms and all that. And uh, so what we are working now is in offer this map generation tool that uses all these different sources of data. And the idea is to also have uh, usability metrics. Like once it's offered, how do we know that these maps or these tools are being useful for you? So that requires a lot of input from you, the, the community. And also uh, we are looking forward for this process. And that's it for me. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Antonio. It's um, every time you provide an overview of this, it's so it's, it's mind blowing. Um, <laughs> so thank you for, for sharing that. It's wonderful to see it progressing um and seeing it develop over time so we're going to move right along uh, so we can make sure we leave enough time for the uh, community discussion um so as you know max had already started us on our journey and we heard from from david and antonio about the, some of the progress that's been made from okw round one um, the lessons that we learned, and again, so much appreciation for all of the work that has been done. Um, the round one of the awardees um, really taught us a lot about, you know, some of the, the ways in which we could structure the award program to address some of the issues that were brought up about the quality of data being collected, um, additional support that could be provided to awardees for information sharing, um, and for communicating project work. Um, and also uh, one of the big pieces that came up and David alluded to this a bit in his presentation is that um, there was more of a focus that was um, being discovered that was needed for education um, to really talk with community members and volunteers who were getting engaged in collecting um, this data. And so, we took taking what we learned from round one. Um, this is just a little, uh, you know, visual overview of changes that were applied to round two. Um, and there are links, and any and all of these links, and we'll be putting some in chat, but they're all included in the notes um, and will be sent out along with the presentation slides. Um, we now have a community forum and channel for our round two awardees to share their work as it is ongoing and to have them asking questions and interacting with the community. Um, you know, we have a, a much more um, visual uh, representation of the toolbox. I shared a link in chat regarding the um, OKW um, toolkits and uh, requirements that Antonio put together. 
Um, and we welcome feedback in any of these community forum channels um, and really, really encourage discussion amongst the community members. Um, and we have also added uh, in this particular round, in addition to gathering the data on uh, machine model make um, and more information regarding capacity and capabilities, we are encouraging our um, awardees to also collect photographic evidence that'll be a part of the data mapping process. And so while this is incredibly brief right now, um, but don't worry, you'll be getting presentations from our awardees later on as the work gets started. Um, we have only recently had our initial kickoff meeting and we're just getting things going. Um, I want to introduce you, you know, visually to all of the awardees. We have three distinct teams working on mapping manufacturing capabilities in Greece, Cameroon, and across Nigeria. And I encourage you all, you can either scan the QR code here, or like I said, we'll share all of these links after the fact as well. Um, you can keep an eye on their work as it is ongoing in our community channel and um, I encourage you to ask questions, interact, uh, engage, and you know, contribute to the ongoing data collection and work with OKW. So I am going to pass it back over to Max Awarda to get us started on next steps, the, the next stage for OKW and how we're going to get the community involved and, and what we would like to hear from you. Go for it, Max. Thanks, Sarah, and thanks, yeah, thanks, Antonio and David, for um, sharing your work. As, as Sarah said, it's always really um, impressive to see uh, all the work that's being done across uh, all these different initiatives. Um, so, what we'd like to do is, um, yeah, just basically start in um, um, hearing from you um, about. So we've covered sort of, you know, the work that where, where you know where the whole journey started and what's been going on now, and what we're looking at now is sort of um, opening up different ways of engaging with the community, um, um, opening up different channels of sort of um, looking at what kinds of use cases um, this kind of, these efforts around uh, mapping of manufacturing uh, uh, worldwide um, can, can help uh, with the sort of this move towards distributed manufacturing. Um, and um, the link there that I think, Sarah, you shared it at the beginning, I don't know if you want to share it again, this is the link to the document that we're doing, so please feel free uh, the, uh, to um, um, to contribute to that document if, um, if you like. Um, and what we are also um, uh, looking at doing now is to um, basically put forward some prompts to you. Um, oh, sorry, I think you need to refresh that slide, Sarah. Sorry about that, it uh, doesn't seem to be up to date. Um, I can okay, just give me a second. <laughs> paste the link here. This is the link. Um, I've just, yeah, I've pasted the link into the chat as well. So these are some prompts. Um, as, you, as you've seen, Overall, there are sort of three main areas of work, if you, if you want to think about it that way, in terms of the work with, with OKW. There's the sort of the mapping of facilities um, and the machines and tools that are in those uh, facilities, as well as the manufacturing capabilities and the manufacturing processes. I think David spoke quite well to the need to sort of expand the work around sort of what kinds of processes are being mapped, et cetera. Um, so with that in mind, we have these questions for you that are in this, uh, if you open the link, you're going to see sort of four columns. Um, and the, the four questions are basically really understanding from you very specifically, sort of diving into some of the specifics. So, you know, what are the manufacturing processes and capabilities that you need for your work? So here we're really looking for you to sort of provide concrete use cases based on your own sort of um, experiences and, and needs. Um, the other one is machines and tools. Again, if you can sort of elaborate, um, put down, um, put down um, as much detail as you want in terms of what what are the kinds of machines and tools that you would use, um, and a little bit more about the locations. And I think the locations, not just in terms as well as the geographic location itself. I think it'll be interesting if you can expand a little bit more on the context of, um, you know, is do you would you see this being used more in a sort of a local setting in terms of 
you know the city or the region that you're in or would you see uh, do you have sort of needs for being able to um, know what capabilities exists in other parts of the world for example and um, last but not least is sort of you know uh, as well as these three sort of areas of you know, a map of facilities and um, data related to machines and tools and manufacturing capabilities. Is there anything else in the context of uh, mapping of manufacturing that you feel um, needs to be addressed or worked on under this um, OKW initiative? And what I'd invite you to do um, is to bookmark this. So please, you know, this is going to be open um, past the call. You can go in and add more information. You can start adding some now. But these are just some prompts to start this conversation around sort of the next steps that we're going to be um, working on with the um, within the Open Nowhere effort. Um, so if you want to skip to the next slide, Sarah, so if you don't mind switching back sure. to the slides. Sure. OK. Um, so uh, you can see that, yeah, the current use cases are very much focused on the inventory, essentially, you know, what machines and tools are, are, are available at, at, at which locations. There's um, there isn't any sort of separate effort um, addressing um, uh, processes within within the Open Nowhere sort of working group, um, and um, what we're looking for again, this is I think uh, you know in the context of uh, the answers that you that we'd like you to provide in 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 that uh, Padlet, uh, but also you know to open up the discussion around sort of what are the use cases. Um, that you need that that you see will you know where you would need to actually go into a map and actually use the map and whether it's the use case of uh, people contributing data or the end users of that data as well. So looking at the whole sort of you know input output sort of pipeline of of the data. Um, and uh, if you'd skip to the next slide, please, um, Sarah. The uh, uh, what we're doing now as well, and this is a wider move within the alliance, is we're sort of rebooting, reconfiguring these initiatives, these efforts. Um, uh, open the Open Nowhere initiative is um, sort of perhaps further ahead in this reconfiguration than other initiatives at the moment, but uh, this is an effort that's going um, across the board where. Um, the the effort so far has been the working group has been very much focused on the the data standard, and what we're doing is we're moving it sort of towards being a much wider initiative than just looking at the one data standard, um, and so we've set up a, a steering committee, a sort of a proto steering committee now that is looking at this sort of reboot, um, and what we're looking for, and hopefully this will again sort of help contextualize these questions um, in the context of of these changes that we're doing is. Um, you know, what other ideas, that last question that I asked in those prompts, you know, what other ideas are there other than the ones that we're currently working on that you would like to see us, to, to, with, that you might want to propose to be included in this initiative? Um, and if you look at that yellow um, sort of circle up in the top right, that's where, um, you know, these the task forces that we're setting up to look at the current tooling, to look at the, the current data standards that are in use and the current efforts that are in use. Um, we're looking to sort of find people who are interested in actually joining these task forces and um, getting these efforts um, sort of structured in a, basically structured in a way that, that moves us, as I said, into this more, more wide ranging um, way of looking at distributed manufacturing from, a, from the perspective of mapping as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Max. I think what I'm going to do um, is stop the screen share um, because we have a few minutes left, um, under 10 minutes left. And so what we will be doing, and let me also unmute my video so you can see that a person exists behind the voice. Hello. Um, and so as, um, you know, thank you for, for going, moving through all of that information. It's, it's a lot. It's a, it's a lot. And I know that there are some folks on the call today who have been working with OKW for quite some time. And then there are others who are, are relatively new. Um, we are going to be continuing to, to ask these questions and gather information. Um, that Padlet that Max shared, the, the green screen with the three different columns of questions, 
Um, we will post that to the community forum um, and send that as a follow up here so that we can continue to gather information from you asynchronously. But in these remaining um, moments, uh, going back to that that prompt that Max was was referring to of, of use cases, we would really like to hear from you and we invite anybody to you can you can raise your hand, you can just unmute yourself and start talking. Um, but we're really seeking to, to grow and further develop OKW by gathering more use cases and hearing from you on where you think it would be useful and applicable for your own work. So that's where I'm going to pause and zip, zip myself and encourage you to just jump in. Since I'm brand new here, hi everyone. Um, uh, does anybody have a use case they can start off with rather than proposing brand new ones? I can see the map and my sort of reaction to it is clearly it's an imperfect map right now. Even if it was perfect, what would we do with it? What has anybody done with it? Um, could somebody talk about a use case? That would be great for me. Go for Antonio. Yeah. So what are we discussing right now is how to match a, a project description of a project manifest to locations. And uh, we are in the open discussion right now on how to design this uh, matching process, the algorithm behind this. And what's important to refer to is that we identify the need that from before and from now on that there is, we need to define a common language to refer to things like a taxonomy of machines, taxonomy of things. So we can uh, know which fields from the project descriptions match the capabilities of every place. And that we are sure that the size of the machines and the, the build size, I mean, and, and the size of the projects match so, and also, of course, um, uh, the distance and all that is referring to the user. Like if I am a maker, uh, what's the important thing for me that the distances these facilities are, the capabilities, the um, cost of the materials and all that. Uh, like it's not the same to, to have uh, in one place flex plexiglass and in the other, uh, other kind of material that's cheaper and we can know also the different materials that are available, the brands and to know which one will represent a lower cost for me, that will also be important to, to know. So we are in the process of collecting more data to make this more useful, but yeah, that's the way we are looking for. But of course, it depends a lot of the inputs of the community. And uh, so, yeah. Thank you, Antonio. I see that David has his hand up as well. Yeah, um, thank you, Sarah. Um, well, following with the discussion that um, that Antonio just just was was just explaining, uh, for me, a little bit of the of the of the learning, or probably a lot of the learning that we got from the first uh, for the first round is, whenever we were interacting with this community, we got. Um, uh, we thought that it was not just enough going into the surveys. So that way we decided to go a little bit deeper and run some uh, of these interviews, asking the people why and what for you use using this, right? And it was pretty rewarding to see that in many of the cases, um, the majority of the, of the, the success or the failure of, of these spaces is that People don't know what they are, the technologies are used for. So I think the centers of these maker spaces are not just, or these manufacturing spaces are not just which type, which type of machinery is available or what type of technology is available, but how do you use it in your daily life? And I think this is the most important part. It's like, how do you engage other members of your community if you don't know what your machines are for, right? And I think one of the beautiful examples that we got into this interview, because we have a lot of that information around, but it is 
not impossible, but is 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 we don't know we don't, we don't have found a way to, to to put it in the into that context on, on the mapping. But for example, one example one of the examples I could, I can give is that when we were interviewing one of these maker spaces that unfortunately shut down during the pandemic, uh, they they referred to uh, an example in which one of the users, which was a medical student. Uh, approach to them, he didn't have any knowledge about engineering or electronics or anything, but he wanted to use those technologies in order to develop uh, a project for a medical device. And he was successful in doing so, and actually he turned his project into a company. So uh, what are the data for? I think it, this is one of the example. Like it could be either uh, for an uh, application in, in the medical field or it, it, on, on the environment, et cetera. We have several other examples of, of that, but we have collected, at least in, in some cases in, in Chile, for example, there's another amazing team that they do robotic and they use it for exploration on the sea, uh, which is sometimes it's very difficult for them to import uh, or build a, a, a very expensive machinery coming from the US or Europe. So they decided to take hands and develop their own machinery for doing uh, marine exploration, but they have to find the places, right? That's the most important part. They have to find where, where are these technologies available and how and where are, are these uh, tools available where, where they can learn to, to create those, those technologies for their own needs. So uh, I think we should probably in the future include these cases, maybe like showcasing how they have developed their, their project and which community they have touched. Like for example, there's another, another great group here in Mexico City that um, is named is Acedores that Probably Antonio is very close to them in the past, I think. And um, they have a very large uh, uh, hub of several schools in, in, in across across Mexico in which they have in, incorporated uh, digital manufacturing technologies into the curricula, which is nice to see that newer generations are getting acquainted with this technology that probably previous generation are not. And maybe that's the reason why many of these spaces are thriving or failing. Yeah, well, that's my talk. <laughs> so also just to, to speak briefly, um, <clears throat> you know, following up on your point and also your your um, your question and, and statement, Mark, um, one of the other emergent themes that has come from this, um, yeah. and it speaks a bit to the comment you just left in chat, is that the specification as it currently, in its current version, does focus a lot on inventory. And it has been identified by the previous awardees and also within conversation with many of our community members that just as important or even more so is the identifi identification of processes and how those are mapped. Because um, this also you know, lend, leads into, um, and since you're new, I think it's worth stating that um, you know, the Internet of Production Alliance is working on uh, five suite, like five families of open data standards that are intended to um, to be interoperable and work together and be complementary in that sense. And so even um, to your point of the, the human little loop being very important, one of the things that I don't remember if it was Andrew or Max that referred to it, um, one of the other uh, pieces of research we're currently working on is um, an open data standard that's related specifically to those people and the people and skills. And so if you have any questions about that, the beta release um, of that standard is now live and feel free to reach out to me um, you know, for follow-up and we'll include that information in the recording of, from this call. Um, I do wanna make a note here. We had scheduled the call for, for 90 minutes with the intent that the last 30 could be open if people you know, had the time to you know, stay for conversation. Um, but this is a very busy time of year and I know a lot of, folks, their time is rather compressed. Um, and so we're going to go ahead and officially um, wrap the call for now. Um, and thank you all for joining. And thank you so much for sharing your experiences and information. And you'll be hearing more from us soon.